Okay. I've got some questions for you, Mr. Writer Man. Who are you? Where's Chris Chibnall? And do you need help hiding the body? Spyfall. Yep. The doctor's back, finally, after a year-long hiatus, and man, is there a way to blow off the dust and cobwebs of a year ill-spent? Oh, oh, man, I'm, I'm coming down from this kind of speeches, and I'm going to work my butt off to try to be as spoiler-free as humanly possible at the very beginning, but that's going to be a very big ask, so... Bear with me. The episode begins, a lot of operatives all around the world are being picked off one at a time, and of course, MI6, not knowing who else to turn to, turns to the doctor, and of course the doctor brings her team. When they arrive, they end up finding that, well, some of their agent's DNA is being rewritten completely, to the point where there's no way that this body could have ever existed. And this leads them on this big globe-trotting adventure. Ryan and Yaz go to San Francisco to investigate this tech mogul. Meanwhile, you got the doctor and Graham, who end up going to touch base with this this MI6 analyst who was an enthusiast of the paranormal. And I definitely have to give credit to Chibnall for writing what may have been a pretty weird decision in the previous episode, Resolution, the fact that he actually is carrying on with the idea that Unit Torchwood are now defunct. And I'm wondering if he might be moving forward, carrying on from here. And now, I wish I could tell you any more than that, but there are some things that pop up in this episode, or specifically one major thing that pops up in the final cliffhanger, but everything that leads up to this moment is all stuff that I can't spoil, but I can definitely talk about how well organized this episode was. It seemed like Chris Chibnall was actually listening to some of the complaints about the last season, especially concerning the balance of the story regarding the characters and what all of them get up to. Whereas a lot of time you had these episodes which kind of puts uh, Ryan by the wayside, or, and there were a lot of ones which seemed to kind of shelve Yaz and her story. This one gave every single one of them something to do, and there were great stakes in all areas of concern. We see Ryan in the dead beginning playing basketball, but the whole thing about his dyspraxia is still a thing. I like that they're still carrying on with these little tidbits about these characters and that we tend to forget about. When we see Graham again, he's at the doctor's, making sure that his cancer is still in remission. And then you've got Yaz, who's still juggling her family, traveling with the doctor, and of course, trying to get herself settled as a police officer. The fact that they jumped right in and they were able to establish what they've all been up to since the last time we saw them, and to see that they more or less are still having a hard time juggling their regular lives and their lives with the doctor. Wait a minute, wait a minute, Chibnall, this is not the you that we're used to here. You mean to tell me you actually paid attention to the, a lot of the criticisms of the last season that you actually wanted to focus on each and every one of the characters? Oh my god, this is weird! This is absolutely weird. The one major thing I did praise about last season, and it's definitely on display in this first episode, the production value of that last season was probably the best it had ever been, with a lot more polished filmmaking as far as like the action, and as far as the designs. It really felt cinematic, and it felt epic. And this one really pushed that to a whole new level. And they're chasing this entity, which just seems like this shape with no real form except humanoid and it's just glowing and we don't really know what is up with this entity because every time the doctor tries to scan it it seems to always read off as nothing so there's intrigue there's excitement there's thrills there's even some really scary moments there's a really great bit outside a house in the middle of the outback with spotlights in the dead of night and it is legit creepy like classic doctor who freaky and i was i was totally on board for that. On the other side, you've got some great spy action where you got Ryan and Yaz infiltrating this search engine company, and you see them very haphazardly trying to gain the confidence of this tech mogul who very obviously has some weird uh, quirks about him. And meanwhile, at the center of it all is Jodie Whittaker. Now, I was on board with Jodie Whittaker from the very start, but the big question I kept going through my head is, what is she as a doctor? Like, what sort of character archetype is she? We go through the previous history of the doctor and we always seem to have some kind of set idea as to what type of character they are. In the interim between uh, Resolution and this, I figured it out. She's Miss Frickin' Frizzle. That's right. She's Miss Frizzle from the, from the Magic School Bus. And... And when you put the two together, they actually do make sense. Miss Frizzle is absolutely joyous, very energetic, fun-spirited. Uh, people who 
hang out with her, pretty much love her, and she also has a magical traveling vehicle that also puts them all in pretty horrific danger. And for extra measure, the one thing I noticed Jodie Whittaker's doctor did a lot in the last season was when things are going crazy, she still took the time to teach people about things. And I was like, that's a teacher. The 13th doctor is a highly excitable teacher. That's what she is. And I got so thrilled and I was looking for that in this episode and we got it. And Jody was just on fire. Because this episode is very heavily spy themed, we do get some of the great scenes that we usually see in a spy thriller. We get the classic hero villain banter scene. The doctor actually confronts the tech mogul character and it's actually a really cool, very tense scene. And Jody is so cool in the way she plays it. And I got kind of the chills in the way she did it. And it, I was just consistently energized by this episode. And I hope, I'm hoping, now, I mean, it's a big ask, but I'm hoping that the rest of the season really follows on from the pacing, the energy, the variety of this entire story. It was such a multifaceted opening episode to the season that, yeah, I was seriously debating whether or not it was actually written by Chibnall because normally, I don't see this kind of effervescence from his writing. I don't. I mean, the only one that I could say was pretty close to it was uh, Dinosaurs on a Spaceship. Really? So, I guess I praised a lot of it enough. Now we have to get into... Now, like I said, there is a character named O who's an, who's an analyst for MI6, who is actually played by Sasha Dewan, who many people might remember has a long history with Doctor Who, specifically playing Wars Hussein in An Adventure in Space and Time. When you meet him, he's a very ecstatic, kind of shut-in character who kind of actually enjoys his solitude a little too much, it seems. But then the ball gets dropped at the dead end of the episode. He's the f***ing master! The Master is back way sooner than I expected. I get this feeling that Sasha Dewan may have just was kind of like bursting to let this out. Like, you wonder if they delayed filming the last scene of this episode so that way he could get to the... Because he's like, oh, come on, I want to get to... I want to let loose, I want to let loose. And man, when he lets loose, he goes absolutely batty. My main worry was, is he going to channel Missy a little too much in this? Is it going to be a little too John Sim? Um... He might be leaning a little bit towards John Sim, but then again, this has only been a couple minutes, so we don't really know the full ebb and flow of what he's going to bring to the table as the master yet. But at the second the cat's out of the bag, when he's revealed to be the master, that immediately his body language changes, his personality changes. He just is absolutely overjoyed to have pulled the wool over the doctor's eyes. And the thing is, the doctor's reaction is our reaction. I'm having a hard time functioning, and I'm just like, bah, 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 bah. Uh -huh. I do have one worry about this whole thing. I'm worried that uh, in having him come back and being evil again, are we effectively retconning uh, what they developed so well with Missy at the end of season 10? I really don't want that to happen because I love Missy so much, and I really did feel her development all the way up until that last moment. Now, I always know that the Master does have all these get out of death free cards, but it felt like in that moment, in that episode, it felt like not only would the Master be willing to die from that moment, but also kind of laugh about the fact, about that fact. I don't know. And if by some miracle she had survived and subsequently regenerated, all of a sudden bad again, it feels like it would have been a slap in the face. Uh, let, I'm going to use this example. It would have feel like Chibnall, J.J. Abrams, Moffitt's Ryan Johnson. You know, I'm riding with that metaphor. I hope they illustrate a bit more as to where in the timeline this master is. There's a lot of points in the master's life we don't know about. We don't know about a lot of his life prior to Roger Delgado. This could be pre-Delgado. This could even be, actually, even in a funny way, uh, we don't actually know, per se, whether or not John Sims' master regenerated directly into Missy. Once they're saying he didn't regenerate into this new master, and that as time will come, that master will regenerate into Missy. Who knows? I I hope something like this is the case, because I really just would not like the idea that all that development with the master that we were doing in season 10 just gets thrown by the wayside. Now, you could say that it's a regeneration quirk, and I suppose I could take that explanation, but it's a touch light when... All this work was done to redeem the Master as a character, and the fact that they do such a great job with Missy during that arc, and then just to throw it all by the wayside, that, that feels kind of spiteful. And I hope, hope, hope 
they find some way to write around it. And again, even though Chibnall did blow my mind with this episode, there's still a little part of me in the back of my head worried that Chibnall's just going to fall back into old habits. I don't know. I'm This whole episode was so strikingly good, like way better than Jim Null's usual standards. There's even a hint that there might even be an arc this season, which was something the last season didn't have. I didn't mind because it was different, it was refreshing that they want to have self-contained stories, but every now and then I, do, I don't mind a good arc. As long as there's a good balance between original stories and the story as a whole, that's fine. It's a fantastic start to the season. I was tempted to wait until the second half, but I just couldn't wait. This had to be talked about. What else is there to say? It's a hell of a start. Uh, the internet was not lying to you. This was just wild. It was energetic. It was fun. There were villains. There were great monsters. There was moments of suspense. There was moments of laughs. Even with all these crazy things in this episode, it felt like old school who, like going back to the days of Pertwee. It's early to tell depending on how the story resolves, but so far it is another crown jewel in Jodie Whittaker's run as the Doctor. So, do you agree? Do you disagree? Do you think this may have blown its wad a little too early? Do you think it may have done a touch too much fan service? Or do you think that this might be another new highlight in the ever-growing list of highlights in the history of Doctor Who? Leave it all in the comments below, and for more addictive content on Narcotic Casserole, simply like, share, subscribe, click, thou shalt be served.